Hello and welcome to North Star Oasis. This is August 2nd already. Yeah, it just seems like it wasn't too long ago we were at 17 below zero temperatures and uh, the middle of December and here we are already past uh, the month of July and heading into August. I mean, it feels like we have an early fall already on the way, but as Joe Bastardi has told us, we're running on 60-day cycles, hot cycle, cool cycle, hot cycle, cool cycle. We're in a cool cycle now. Mid-September, I expect that we'll see 60 days of above normal warmth. Anyhow, thanks for joining us here on North Star Oasis. I'm your host, Jeff Williams, with another uh, jam-packed, action-filled information overload heading your way just for you. Uh, I was looking at an article in the New York Times last night. I was talking about the essentially the death of the Civil War reenacting hobby. How it today has people in the mid 40s and up is about the only people who are really out reenacting, and there's just not enough replacement from the uh, youth, you know, the people in the 20s and the 30s. This has been, of course, in decline for a long time now. Uh, the high watermark was 1998, the Gettysburg reenactment. The New York Times article specified there were 30,000 reenactors and 50,000 spectators. Really, the truth was there were probably more like 45,000 reenactors. I can tell you that because I was there right in the middle of it. It was not 30,000, there were a lot more. Uh, but nonetheless, there have been changes in society which have been in part to the uh, death of the reenacting hobby. But it's not the only thing that's changed. Yes, comedy has also changed. As a matter of fact, I was just, uh, well, well we, uh, just before we went on air, I had a little bit of downtime. I was looking at Facebook and I posted a, a piece last night that was you know, sarcasm. My comments were sarcastic and then there was a photoshopped image of a uh, a guy on a plane, holding onto a plane wing. There's two images, and then there was a video of this guy um, running around an airport flight line. Um, and it's amazing how many people actually took that seriously. And if you actually use a little bit of common sense, you realize that this is just sarcasm. This is just cheap entertainment. And yet people were like, "Oh, oh, oh this is like Photoshop. Like that's a big." Big revelation that you figured out that something that's obviously photoshopped is photoshopped. Uh, but that, does that take away from the humor nonetheless? It shouldn't. But we have a strange death of comedy. Now, back when I was growing up, we used to have guys like Robin Williams, who I met, and uh, he's still my all-time favorite comedian. Uh, I've also met Colin Quinn, uh, another comedian. Uh, when I was in Iraq, I uh, had a few seconds of FaceTime on Colin Quinn's uh, program on the comedy, uh, comedy uh, it was the Comedy Channel back then, I, th I think. And uh, then, of course, you got Jay Leno and Johnny Carson. These guys were funny. They could find humor in anything and everything. And there was nothing that was off limits. They made fun of, uh, at least uh, as far as Leno and um, Johnny Carson, they made fun of Democrats and Republicans alike. If you are a politician in office, you would get roasted on The Tonight Show. It didn't matter what your political affiliation was. It came with the territory. But the jokes that Carson and Leno made were actually funny. And then, of course, you can't forget Eddie Murphy and Raw and uh, Richard Pryor. I mean, Pryor could make jokes. I mean, he made a lot of, a lot of jokes, some of them really sick jokes, in the black community, and he was a black man. We have gone away from having every, being, everything being funny to now nobody is allowed to laugh. Here's our Prager University segment called The Strange Death of Comedy. Three white men walk into a bar. You're a racist. Is that a joke? In today's hypersensitive world, it's hard to know what's funny anymore. And as someone who makes his living as a comedian, that's a big problem. Ask Jerry Seinfeld. He's announced he won't play college campuses. He doesn't want to deal with all the political correctness. And he's not exactly edgy. Comedy is important. 
Why? Because it's a pressure valve that allows us to discuss uncomfortable truths in a friendly way. Laughs are better than punches. But identity politics is killing the gag. How many times have you heard someone say something like this? You're not black, so you don't know what it's like to be me. You're a man, so you can't have an opinion about any issues affecting women. As a left-handed pansexual leprechaun, only I really know about elevator safety. Comedy only works when we agree on certain realities. Take this joke. Why do you always go fishing with at least two Baptists? Because if you only take one, he'll drink all your beer. The reason this gets a laugh is because most of us recognize that many religious people are a little more religious around other religious people. That hypocrisy is funny because everyone can relate to it on some level. We're all a little hypocritical now and then. The problem is that today, fewer and fewer people seem to agree on the basics. You know, shared assumptions. I recently did a joke on stage. People keep comparing Donald Trump to Adolf Hitler. He's nothing like Hitler. Hitler would have never let CNN talk like that. Anderson Cooper wouldn't have made it through the night of the long knives. There are people that don't understand that joke. And the reason is that joke requires us all to agree and stick with me here that Hitler was a bad, bad man and that the night of long knives was a bad, bad thing. And that President Trump, whether you like him or not, isn't anything like that bad, bad man who did that bad, bad thing. And I wouldn't want him to be. But since we now live in a world where some stupid people like Hitler and some other stupid people think Trump is Hitler, well, we just can't agree that this obviously absurd joke is funny. We can't even agree that it's obviously absurd. How about this? Why did the chicken cross the road? Why is the rooster being paid more for crossing the same road? Is that absurd enough for you? During the run-up to the release of the movie Black Panther, all the marketing push was about how, finally, there was a black movie made by black people, with black people for black people. I found this to be fairly hilarious, so I simply took any statement about the film and responded as a white person that actually had that insane way of viewing the world. I just saw the trailer for Black Panther. Ugh, no white people. Looks terrible. Hard pass. Who am I supposed to relate to? No one's white. Not one, but two prominent black actors, Don Cheadle and Jeffrey Wright, started tweeting me about how it's time black people had a movie and how I should be more sensitive to their situation. Keep in mind, both of these black actors are already rich and famous. I figured this was such an obviously satirical take on identity politics that no one could miss the joke. Nope. I was releasing a little social stress through satire. That's what comedians are supposed to do. Releasing social stress used to be the special task of late night comedy, the place that everyone could meet at the end of a long day. But that's dead too. Nobody takes themselves more seriously than these former comedians. Seems like Jimmy Kimmel cries more often than he tells jokes these days. And Stephen Colbert is just Rachel Maddow with punchlines. As if we weren't already divided enough, they're only telling jokes for half the country now. There's no shortage of things to laugh about. We just need to find them together. And if we don't, we'll explode. And that's not a joke. I'm Owen Benjamin for Prager University. So next time you turn on a late night TV show and you think you're gonna get some comedy, think again. Comedy as we once knew it is dead. And unfortunately, it's really, really sad to see. Anyhow, we are actually gonna move on to a serious topic now. Uh, when President Trump and Kim Jong-un met in uh, Singapore back in June, there was a promise that U.S. war dead from the Korean War would be coming home. Well, that's actually happened, at least with the first batch. Fifty-five sets of remains were uh, on their way home. So let's, uh, first they were brought from North Korea into South Korea, and then they began their journey home just yesterday. Let's take a look at the first clip. At a time like this, 
in such a solemn observance, the time for words should be kept short, and the time for solemn observation of military tradition to honor fallen comrades must be the primary focus of our attention. So after they were boarded on the aircraft, the C-17 out of Osan Air Base, South Korea, they were flown to Hickam Air Force Base in Hawaii. And it is at, uh, in Hawaii that the remains will be uh, processed for identification purposes. And from what I understand, only one set had a, po uh, a possible identification. There is one dog tag that was uh, with one set of remains, but there was no conclusive evidence that that person is indeed the same person on the uh, dog tag. So uh, the 55 sets of remains will be uh, gone through, uh, DNA analysis done and all that. And if you've watched the show for any great length of time, we've kind of covered that process with the USS Oklahoma remains from World War II. There's no doubt that a similar process uh, will be conducted on these remains as well. So here is the um, video of the uh, arrival in Hawaii. Some have called the Korean War the Forgotten War. But today, we prove these heroes were never forgotten. Today, our boys are coming home. On June 12th, President Trump traveled to a historic summit in Singapore with Kim Jong-un of North Korea as our president entered into negotiations with North Korea. He also had our fallen on his heart. As he secured a commitment for the complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula, our president also secured a promise from Chairman Kim to return the remains of all fallen U.S. service members lost in North Korea. I know that President Trump is grateful that Chairman Kim has kept his word. And we see today as tangible progress in our efforts to achieve peace on the Korean Peninsula. May God bless the memory of our fallen and their families. May God bless all who have served and served to this day in the uniform of this great nation. And may God continue to bless the United States of America. Now this is just the first batch of remains and it is not a complete and full accounting. Uh, there are still a lot of, uh, there were actually 389 known POWs from Korea that were never uh, returned. 
Uh, perhaps these 55 might be in them, but there are still even more. Uh, actually, after that ceremony concluded, or as the ceremony concluded, uh, Vice President Pence received the flag uh, that was over uh, the casket of one of the remains. you with one of the American flags that was on the first transfer case brought off an aircraft today. And we, uh, we would be honored for you to take this back to Washington, D.C. and present it to the Command War Memorial on behalf of all of us. Thank you for all of your support. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Admiral Longwell. Very honored by that. My great honor to carry this back to uh, our Korean War Memorial, where uh, it will be displayed. I just have to correct myself that I just before that I had misspoken when I said from the casket it was probably not from the ca from the casket because the caskets had just arrived and I I don't think that this administration would be uh, that cruel so to speak to just grab one of the casket flags and say, hey we're taking this no no so I misspoke um, that that would have been a ceremonial flag whether it came from Osan and came over with the caskets or whether it was just handed at Hickam, the fact is the vice president got a flag to take back to the Korean War Memorial in Washington. But I wanted to make sure that what I said was corrected right away so as not to impugn the vice president. Anyhow, uh, also I looked up that there are over 7,800 U.S. military personnel who uh, fought who were still unaccounted for and as many as 388 may have been held as POW in North Korea. Uh, that does not mean that, let's separate here, 388 known to be POW, prisoner of war, but then that doesn't mean that uh, there aren't more that are unaccounted for as MIA, missing in action. That would all be in that 7,800 number. All right, anyhow, uh, here is a little bit more about the processing of remains from the Defense POW MIA Accounting Agency. Human remains that North Korea turned over to the U.S. will be taken to this Defense Department lab in Hawaii, where scientists will begin the painstaking task of determining their identities. When remains come in, there's a process of bringing the remains in in a transparent, but at the same time safe, secure, and defensible way to ensure custody of the remains, to ensure that the remains are well taken care of, and to ensure that they're taken care of with dignity. Forensic experts will be using DNA analysis and other methods to identify the remains. We can take a small uh, sample, a bone or a tooth, and we can look at the isotopes and we can um, determine uh, where, what part of the world that individual grew up in. DPAA. They will also um, use other clues that may be contained in the 55 boxes. It's a jigsaw puzzle, essentially. A lot of uh, circumstantial evidence such as where was this remains found, where who, what could it be, and then they look at the uh, femurs if they have them. Sometimes they only have a fingernail or a tooth. So it's really difficult. 652 sets of Korean War unknowns are still located here in this section. It will likely take months, if not years, to make positive IDs. And it's still not clear whether the remains belong to American servicemen or soldiers from other countries that fought in the war. Well, I think that the big thing is for people to understand the depth that the United States 
goes in honoring their missing service members. Officials hope the effort will eventually bring closure to at least some families of the nearly 7,700 American soldiers who didn't come home from the Korean War. Terry Che, Associated Press. Now, according to the Military Times, U uh, U.S. defense officials have said of the approximately 5,300 Korean War casualties believed to be missing in North Korea, about 91% of them have family reference samples on file already. So out of that 7,800, uh, that means about 1,900 are still somewhere in South Korea, 5,300 are in uh, North Korea, and of course these are all approximates, uh, not actual specific numbers. And so it's going to take a long time for this process to be concluded, but it's a good step in the right direction. Anyhow, we are actually going to move, uh, move on. We're going to turn the page, and we're going to show a video that was done in 2011. It was August 2011 when Neil Armstrong, who uh, was the first man to set foot on the moon, had a chance to review a video of the mission, but with a different take. This was done actually by Google's uh, imaging of the moon, and here is Neil Armstrong discussing the final approach. Now, Armstrong would be turning 87 on uh, August 5th if he were still alive today. Actually, I'm sorry, he'd be turning 88 uh, if he were still alive today. He passed away in August of 2012. So this was a year before he passed away when uh, this event in Australia was held. This slide shows the trajectory to the surface. The actual power descent of the lunar module to the surface took 12 minutes and 32 seconds. And this is just the final three minutes, the part that's really interesting as you get close to the surface of the moon. Now, in the left screen, you will see the original 1969 movie film that we took from the window of the lunar module eagle and on the right side you will see what the crew saw looking out the window in front of them now th there is a, a shaded area there that shows you the exact duplicate of the area that's on the left so you can compare the craters and see if they are duplicate of each other the one on the left took place 42 years ago this pictures on the right took place in the last two years Okay, we've been descending. Uh, I should tell you, you'll hear the crewmen talking. My, they're my co-pilot giving altitude and, and descent rates, and you'll hear people in the background uh, talking from mission control on Earth. We've been descending uh, about 2,000 meters a minute. We're now down to uh, about below 1,000 meters in altitude. Uh, you see, my my uh, com my computer tells me that we're it's taking us to a landing just on the right side of that big crater on the up in the up left hand corner the slopes are steep and the rocks look very large the size of automobiles certainly not a place that i want to land so i took over manually from the computer the autopilot and flew it like a helicopter on out to the west to try to find a smoother more level landing spot. The computer is complaining now and then. You'll hear caution alarms, 1202s and 1201s, which uh, is telling us the computer is a little bit concerned about its operation, but everything looks good, and the people in mission control tell us we can continue. Okay, we're about to. 100 meters above the sort of looking down at this 30 meter crater about eight meters deep looks like a real geological trader uh, treasure I want to go back there and look at that if I ever get the chance while I'm on on my, my on foot 
We're looking for a, a smooth spot beyond that crater. I see a smooth spot right up near the top of the screen. It looks like that's a, that's a good place to be. And I'm running low on fuel. I have less than two minutes of fuel. Getting down below about 70 meters now. 50 meters, still looking good. In the left side, you will see in the old movie that the rocket engine is starting to kick up some dust, dust off, the, off the surface. Get a 30 second fuel running. Need to get it down on the ground here pretty soon before we run out. Okay. It, it's, the, the picture on the left is more accurate, but there's more dust. There you see the shadow of my landing leg coming on, on the surface on the blowing dust. We're very close to the, the surface right now. Okay, engine stop. We copy it down, Eagle. Tranquility base here. The Eagle has landed. And that was done on August 24th, 2011, and Neil Armstrong passed away on August 25th, 2012, so 367 days later. There was a leap year in there. Um, and that was, I think, it's, being a space geek, it's actually absolutely fascinating. You never see that type of uh, graphic animation on that moon landing and that final descent. You don't, uh, you know, we see the picture from 1969, but we don't necessarily see the bigger picture of the moon that we're able to, we're capable of doing today. And then to hear Neil Armstrong uh, discussing uh, moving over, over the crater and the reason why he went on to um, manual instead of autopilot, it all makes sense. I had heard for years that Neil Armstrong, uh, of course, the story was always that they were going to go into the crater, not to the right side of it. That's, again, stories. But then to hear Neil Armstrong say, oh, yeah, the rock, the rock's the size of automobiles, and so I put it on a manual. Well, that makes sense now. So I just wanted to make sure that as we have Neil Armstrong's, it would have been his 88th birthday coming up this week, uh, right after the 49th anniversary of the Apollo 11 moon landing, that this would probably be the uh, appropriate time to show that video. So that's kind of my little five-minute tribute uh, or six-minute tribute to uh, the late Neil Armstrong. Now, as I said, this is a jam-packed, action-filled information overload. That means we're going to still shift gears one more time. Uh, of course, we've got the Minnesota primary election coming up in 12 days, and we're starting to see a increase in activity, mainly on the TV ads. So we're going to do a little bit of election commentary. We're going to start off right after the conventions were held in June, the first weekend in June. Uh, Hamlin University professor and uh, political analyst David Schultz went on, I think this one is it's either CARE 11 or WCCO, uh, and gave his views on the upcoming DFL primary, especially for governor. So we're going to play that right now. The GOP and DFL endorsing conventions may be over, but the race for Minnesota governor has gotten more complicated, not less. The GOP endorsed candidate Jeff Johnson will face former Governor Tim Pawlenty in an August 14th primary. And also on that primary day, the DFL endorsed candidate Representative Aaron Murphy will face Congressman Tim Walls here to help us sort out the results. Professor David Schultz of Hamlin University, thank you so much for coming in. You're welcome, All of right. course. Let's talk about Representative Aaron Murphy. This was a bit of a surprise that she was able to pull this out. What was the difference here? I think a couple of things happened. One is she got into the race early. She did a lot of traveling. If campaigning means anything, and I think it does, she visited lots of places. But also in the last week, you could see that she was getting lots of major public sector union endorsements and private sector ones. And I think that helped also. And I think she was working very hard in flipping the delegates. Right. So I think a combination of those things were very important. Plus, I think she was getting the support of, of the urban liberals, of which Tim Waltz never got that support. 
Right. Interesting that, that her celebratory dance is actually going sort of viral in a mini way right. on social media. Really sort of a unique response, uh, one that you don't see from Minnesota politicians. Your thoughts on that? I was going to say yes. I mean, generally we think of ourselves as a pretty reserved state. I, I was kidding with Jeff Johnson before he went on the air and said, I think he ought to do that at the Republican <laughs> maybe, convention. Too. Maybe that's the answer. <laughs> yes. I don't know. I don't know. I'll, I don't how good of a dancer he is. I'll let him make that decision. <laughs> okay. But no, but clearly I think sometimes becoming a rock star doesn't hurt in terms of your campaign. All right. Uh, let's talk about uh, the race between uh, Representative Aaron Murphy and Congressman Walls. Uh, Congressman Walls has $1.6 million in the bank. Uh, Representative Murphy, maybe 400000 looking at the financial disclosures. Is that an issue? Well, it's an issue except for the fact as the endorsed candidate, Aaron Murphy now gets the party support mailing lists, and that'll help with some of the resources. Uh, but, but at the end of the day, again, we are looking at an August primary. I'm guessing total, total in the state between Republican and Democrats turning out, we might get 8% of the vote. This is going to be about mobilizing wow. you know, small numbers of people. And I think one of the things that Tim Walt still has an advantage with is in the sense that he probably has greater appeal in greater Minnesota. And the question is going to be now how well he mobilizes in greater Minnesota, picks up some of the urban liberals versus the turnout among the urban liberals for Aaron, uh, for Aaron Murphy and whatever she can pick up in greater Minnesota. All right. How about the Johnson Pawlenty race? You just heard Commissioner Johnson say he knows he's going to be outspent in this. Again, does, does that not matter as much because it's an August primary? Well, again, it's for, for some of the same reasons here, that mon money may not be as big of a factor. Um, I still think the biggest factor, at least for the Republicans, is going to be Trump. And what I mean by Trump is that Jeff Johnson, you know, was there supporting Donald Trump, um, right, you know, before the election. Um, Tim Pawlenty was not. And I think the party, Republican Party, of what it looks like now is a very different party than it was e um, even in 2016, but clearly the last time Tim Pawlenty um, won eight years ago, eight years ago, 12 years, actually 12 years ago, I'm sorry to say. Um, and so that we have to think in terms of where the center of the party actually right. is at this and point. And the president remains very popular amongst the base, amongst Republicans here in Minnesota. Right. And we shouldn't forget the fact that Donald Trump got within 50,000 votes of, of being Hillary Clinton. This is a state that is politically changing and it's very different than the state that again okay. Tim Pawlenty was successful in you know 12 and 16 years ago. Okay. What happened to Lori Swanson, a three-time attorney general, not getting the endorsement on the first ballot? Well, I think at the end of the day, it comes down to a singular thing, issue, guns. And what I mean by that, in 2010, um, she received an A-plus rating from the NRA because she and many other attorney generals signed on to a Supreme Court brief saying that the Second Amendment um, in in included an individual right to bear arms. And I think that's becoming a, a defining issue within the Democratic Party, guns versus not. I think that's one issue. I think the second thing is about her enter, entering the race late because she was kind of flip-flopping, running governor or not. But I also think we're starting to see this generational shift going on in the Democratic Party. If I can bring it back to Aaron Murphy, you know, if Tim Waltz and Lori Swanson represent one generation, Aaron Murphy and um, Matt Pelican represent a different generation. And I think the Democrats come out of this convention um, um, less unified than do the Republicans coming out of their convention. All right. Well, Professor David Schultz, always a pleasure. Thank you so much for coming in. You're welcome. The one thing I will say that I agree with David Schultz on is uh, what he mentioned right at the very end about the generational shift. Yes, that is very true. On the Democrat side especially, there is a huge generational shift. Uh, it happens, well, every generation. Uh, the Republicans have not had the generation shift yet because if that were the case, then the endorsement would not go to a baby boomer because that's all we seem to do now is keep baby boomers in power and office even much longer than the previous generation at the expense of younger generations like Gen X and millennials and soon to be Gen, was it Gen Z's coming up? Um, but the Republicans still continue to hold on to baby boomers. We haven't seen that generational shift happen yet. We're starting to see that on the Democrat side right now. So I will agree with David Schultz on there. Some of the other stuff, I could probably disagree or give him partial credit, but actually I did not want to spend a great deal of time on picking apart David Schultz's comments. So we are actually going to move on to, I just want to use that to set the tone for something that happened right after the, primary, or the uh, conventions in, in June. Because now, a couple of weeks ago, we came out with another story about how 
Minnesota elections are attracting record number of political ads, which is, by the way, something that I mentioned back in the early part of 2017, that Minnesota is going to be one of the biggest targeted states in the country and expect to see a lot more money coming from outside groups into this country. I've said that before. Now, local news stations are saying that they're surprised at how much money is coming in. They're not listening. North Star Oasis was on top of this for quite a long time. Anyhow, let's take a look at the story. We're in the money. You've probably already seen them on your TVs and smartphones. Hi, I'm Tina Smith. Political ads and plenty of them. <laughs> Minnesota currently ranks second in the nation behind only California in political ad spending with more than $20 million committed to Minnesota elections already. And I think it could easily double that by November, so $40 million? Election expert and political author Stephen Shear says the spending is unprecedented, with Republicans currently leading the way, but Democrats aren't far behind. The key races that are drawing money right now are the U.S. Senate races. They always draw big money. Especially for Al Franken's old seat, which Republicans see as a big priority this election. Minnesota also has three highly contested House seats up for grabs, bringing in millions from various election committees and super PACs. Outside money is flowing into Minnesota in huge amounts. The crowded governor's race is also bringing in plenty of outside money. The Republican Governors Association has committed $2.3 million to the campaign, and the Democrat equivalent isn't far behind. There'll be inf an information overload, and a lot of that information will be tainted information from the campaigns that can huge amounts of spin. Sure says both parties are racing to buy up as much TV time as they can, but with dwindling spots available, they're now turning to social media like Facebook to get their messages across. Despite a growing frustration with social media ads that some argue have no filters or way of verifying what's real and what's fake. But if you put enough of it out there, it tends to stick to people like Velcro, <laughs> and then they get the message. It takes extraordinary strength. Gordon Severson, CARE 11 News. And yes, he is right. If you throw enough of them out there, it, something tends to stick. We see this in every election cycle. How many times have you seen the false advertising coming up from one campaign or one super PAC to damage the uh, credibility of an opposing candidate. Why are we worried about social media filters when we know that the campaigns and the PACs are buying, buying all these ads? Why are we worried about that? Why are we even worried about the Russians infiltrating our elections because they spent 185000 bucks on Facebook ads when, in 2016 when the Republican Governors Association is just spending a $2.3 million ad buy in one state and the Democrats are going to equal that with their group with about another $2 million ad buy and, and yet we keep hearing about $185,000 spent by the Russians? You want to talk about what influences elections? It's advertising. We do know that. But... Why are we worrying about what's filtered on social media when the news networks are buying up all the spin anyway? We shouldn't be worrying about it. What we should be doing is educating ourselves more and more as to who the people are and what the issues are and make up our minds that way, not by what some talking head, not myself included here, but some talking head uh, uh, on a TV ad will tell you about the opponent. Um, I mean, th there's different. I mean, I at least offer you some commentary, whereas I'm not just going to sit here and say, well, don't vote for so-and-so because of this. In a 30-second ad, throw a sound bite out there. Vote for this person because of this in another 30-second ad. No. Learn. Learn more about the people, the process, the issues, and you, get, you become immune to advertising. So... With that, we're going to take a look at polling data now because when you have advertising, then how do you measure the effectiveness of advertising? You look at it through polling data. But as we discussed in the uh, couple of weeks before the 2016 general election, polling data can even be used as a political weapon. And so the NBC News Marist poll came out, I think it was uh, around July 20th. The uh, sampling was done from July 15th through 19th. So our first thing that we're going to show, and this is coming right from the uh, crosstabs from the NBC News Marist poll, 
Uh, take a look at the number of registers. There's uh, 1,032 registered voters. Or, excuse me, residents. Out of that, 876 registered voters throughout the state were polled. And then they segmented that further, 439 Democrats and 340 Republicans. Now let me just take a quick look here. Uh, 439 Democrats divided by 876 total. So that would be 50.1% Democrat and 340 divided by 876 is 38.8 Republican. So that's what your polling sample is. The rest are, uh, you know, well, it says may not add up to 100% due to rounding. Um, but that's, that's your sample. So keep that in mind when we continue on in this discussion here. So now we're going to go to the next page. First of all, we're going to look at the total approval, disapproval. Amongst residents, that's that 1,000 number. 36% uh, approved, 50% disapproved, 13% unsure, 100% total. Now looking at registered voters, which is pretty much what we had just shown you on, uh, on the electorate. 50% uh, 50.1% 50 are Democrats. And what's the disapprove? Oh, 51%. And the approval of registered voters is 38%. Oh, guess what? 38.8% are, are Republicans. And then it kind of shows that this is going along party lines, but look at how the poll is conducted. Now let's take a look at the next slide. Knowing it's a long way off, what is your preference for the outcome of this November's congressional elections? This is the generic congressional. 36 Republicans, 48 Democrats. Oh, geez. And again, what are those samples? with, you know, 2% uh, of each party going to the unsure, uh, along with the rest who are, you know, the registered voters who would be classified as independents, which would be, what, 11.1%. Uh, hey, this kind of all stacks up just the way that the pollsters have sampled. Next slide, please. Okay, if August Democrat uh, Farmer Labor Party a primary for governor were held today, whom would you support if the candidates are? And this is probably one of the two most accurate parts of the poll that you're going to see right here. That a uh, huge chunk of undecideds, but we're going to take the uh, undecideds out. We're going to take the other out because, you know, there are a couple of other candidates and they're almost irrelevant here. Lori Swanson, 28, Tim Walls, 24, and Aaron Murphy, 11. That's probably the most accurate thing that you're going to see out of the NBC News Marist poll. Because this is a sampling of those 439 Democrats. And this is the way those 439 Democrats are, you know, as far as their preference. So if Lori Swanson is leading, Tim Walls shortly behind, the DFL endorsed candidate slash dancer, uh, Aaron Murphy is, got, is in third with 11. Now, of course, she's probably going to pick up some of those undecideds. Um, is it going to be enough to win? Well, that's what the primary is for. We're going to find that out here in two weeks. Let's go on the Republican side. Uh, on the Republican side, now this is that 38.8% polled. Uh, looking specifically at them, 51% are looking at Tim Pawlenty. Jeff Johnson gets 32, 1% other, and then 16% undecided. That is also probably pretty accurate. Tim Pawlenty has a lot of money in the bank. He's well known throughout the state. Jeff Johnson ran for statewide office twice and lost, has the party endorsement, which is a strength, but he doesn't have as much money in the bank as Tim Pawlenty. So is that going along the lines? Yes, because Republicans are questioning both of them right now, and apparently 51% uh, prefer Tim Pawlenty as of July 19th. Now, as both campaigns ratchet up their ads and they get their get out the vote machine going, those numbers may change, but that's probably a pretty good indication of where the election is at. Now let's go to the next slide. If November's election were held today, notice that the pollsters only put up Tim Pawlenty for the Republican ticket, but they do not put uh, Jeff Johnson. 
So against Tim Walls, 5140. Hmm. 50.1 to 38.8. Yeah, that's right in line with their sampling. Lori Swanson and Tim Pawlenty, oh, 5140. Also in line with their sampling size. And the next one. Aaron Murphy and Tim Pawlenty, 48.40. Notice that Tim Pawlenty is consistently around 40% in this poll, and two, the two front-running Democrats are at 51, and the endorsed Democrat is at 48, a loss of three percentage points there. So how do you read this? I can't read this into what's going on in uh, November. There's one, there's way too much time left. And even if Pawlenty does uh, win the primary, and there's no guarantee that that's going to happen either, you're going to find Tim Pawlenty versus the Democrat winner. And then you're going to start seeing even more money get thrown into this race uh, from across the country. And you're going to see even more advertising, and you're going to see even more pent-up frustrations. And then we're going to actually start seeing where the chips fall at the end of October. Anyhow, uh, something funny happened, if you want to examine the uh, Democrat uh, ticket for now. Uh, and I pretty much gave you the uh, thing. Same thing with uh, David Schultz. You know, plenty has got the money, two-term governor, well-known. Jeff Johnson, two-time loser, has a Republican endorsement, doesn't have enough money. Chances are plenty will win. That's the analysis of the Republican ticket right there. That's our primary. Uh, for the Democrats, what's our primary there? <laughs> the news about Lori Swanson's DFL running mate, the lieutenant governor candidate, Congressman Rick Nolan, coincidentally hit right at the time that this poll was announced. Let's take a look. DFL candidate for Governor Lori Swanson is breaking her silence about the controversy surrounding her running mate. In an article with anonymous sources, MinPost criticized how Congressman Rick Nolan handled a staffer accused of sexual harassment. In response, groups have called for Swanson to address it and for her to drop Nolan from her campaign. Here's WCCO's Jennifer Merrily. This is not a confusing moment. The choice is very clear. Time's up. The group of about 20 stood outside the governor's office demanding answers from Attorney General and gubernatorial candidate Lori Swanson. Leadership means speaking up about things that matter. For more than 24 hours, WCCO asked Swanson to respond to a MinPost article about her running mate. It included reports of women who claimed they were sexually harassed by a high-level staffer in Congressman Rick Nolan's office. That staffer was terminated, but later hired again less than a year later, in 2016, as an independent contractor. He was then fired after complaints. So we call on Representative Nolan to step down immediately as Attorney General Swanson's gubernatorial running mate. Just after three on Friday, Swanson responded saying in part, quote, sexual harassment has no place in the workplace or society. Congressman Nolan has apologized to the women who were harassed by their male coworker and for his own comments. Part of Nolan's response said, quote, I believed them in 2015 when they reported the harassment and when my chief of staff promptly investigated the allegations and let the male staffer go. In hindsight, my congressional campaign committee should not have retained the individual as an independent contractor to work off-site for a brief period of time in 2016. Jennifer Merrily, WCCO 4 News. So funny how right after the poll gets released that... Lori Swanson is leading the Democrat primary. All of a sudden, the bad news comes out about the running mate, uh, Rick Nolan. So now, how to, I mean, even though uh, he's nothing to do with that, with that particular situation, or we might have a little here, um, WCCO, which I also call WDFL, because if you actually go to their Facebook page, you find only one story featuring a Republican candidate here, and that would be a uh, six-minute interview with Tim uh, with um, Eric Paulson, the congressman from Third District. No other Republican is ever mentioned, but you're going to find in the reporting it's constant, giving you all the updates on what's going on with the DFL. So, how does Representative Walls respond to this whole situation with? Uh, his arrival gubernatorial candidates. 
Well, the Minnesota DFL race for governor was rocked this week with a bombshell report in the online journal MinPost accusing Congressman Rick Nolan, Nolan of sheltering a top aide accused of sexual harassment by hiring him as a campaign staffer. Congressman Nolan is running for lieutenant governor as Attorney General Lori Swanson's running mate. Protesters gathered outside Swanson's office Friday demanding she drop Nolan from the ticket. Swanson has issued a statement saying there is no place for sexual harassment in the workplace. Nolan issued a statement saying in hindsight his campaign should not have hired the staffer in 2016 and that when concerns were brought to his attention, the staffer was fired. Attorney General Swanson also accused her DFL opponents, including Congressman Tim Walz, of exploiting the controversy for political gain. We would like to say that DFL candidate for governor Representative Aaron Murphy was a recent guest on this show and that we have asked Attorney General Swanson to be on this show four times since June and she has been unavailable. And now we would like to welcome to the show Congressman Tim Walls, who of course is another one of the DFL candidates running for governor. Congressman Walls, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for having us, ma'am. Uh, we do want to get to, to issues in this race, but I do want to ask you about this uh, allegation from Lori Swanson that you are using this uh, situation, the allegations involving the, Wal the Nolan staffer, for political gain because you are behind in the polls. Well. First of all, everyone should expect to have safety, dignity, and respect in a workplace. Uh, it's a leader's responsibility to provide that. In this case, it was utter lack of, uh, of leadership. No one's disputing the fact that these allegations happen, but it's these types of statements from, uh, from Lori Swanson that prevent women from telling their stories, from, from coming forward. And uh, that's what has to change so that these types of situations stop. Okay. Uh, her statement suggests that uh, the staffer now works for you and that you may be been behind the whole thing. Is that true? Well, it's not true, but the, the fact of the matter is the reporter doing this story, I, I believe, spoke to eight or nine individuals, and uh, they approached someone, the reporters approached someone who worked in my office, and uh, that staffer, that individual, came and asked me and asked our team if we were comfortable with her telling her story. And uh, my response was, I am comfortable with ever best for you and I stand with you on it. But once again, this lack of leadership, this victim blaming, this making it, uh, no one again, uh, on, on, on Friday, a, an audio tape was released of, of Congressman Nolan addressing his employees in his congressional office, again, putting the onus of responsibility for assaults onto women and the victims. Unacceptable, total failure of leadership. Okay. Let me uh, get to the issues here, many of them obviously out there. One of the things you said this week... Okay, that interview just continued on about political issues and away from the Swanson-Nolan uh, uh, stuff, and so we're just going to bring it back here. Notice that Esme Murphy challenges Wallace to say, hey, aren't you behind this? And Wallace just deflects, but this is all posturing after the NBC Marist poll came out. Now, when did all of this, in, when did whoever was behind this have all this information? Probably months ago. Waiting for the opportune time to bring it out, if needed. And lo and behold, Maris poll comes out, and we got to use it because the primary is coming up on the 14th. So that's when you're seeing in the news cycles is political posturing. That is all it is, pure and simple. So now... We got the primary coming up in 12 days. What do you need to know in order to vote? Let's take a look. Turning now to decision 2018, the Minnesota primary election is exactly three weeks away and the last chance to pre-register to vote is today. Care 11's Kaya Edwards is here now with what you need to know. Oh, hey Kaya. Hey, good morning. So to be clear, you can still register to vote on election day, but if you do want a head start, yep, the deadline for pre-registration is today. Today's the last day to pre-register to vote in Minnesota. You can do so by mail, in person, or online. So here's what you need to know if you do sign up online. It'll ask you if you're a U.S. citizen, if you'll be 18 on or before the election, and if you're serving a felony sentence. You'll also need to provide the digits on either your Minnesota driver's license Okay, we're going to cut that one because the last day to register was July 24th. So we're already past that deadline. No sense in giving all of the rest of the information since really right now for the primary election, it's not applicable. So my apologies on that one. Uh, I should have caught that sooner. Um, but we are going to move on because with one last thing before we go for the week. The gubernatorial candidates fundraising numbers... Uh, the pre-primary report has just come out, 
and let's see where they stand. So we're going to go right back to WDFL, uh, WCCO, and they're reporting on this. And notice who is going to get the coverage in the second half of this story. Keep that in mind when I was talking about all the political posturing. So let's take, check this out. Two weeks and county now to Minnesota's 2018 primary. There are hotly contested races for governor, Congress, and U.S. Senate. The Minnesota races for governor, though, are dominating campaign headlines today. Pat Kessler joins us now. So we're seeing a significant ramp up before this primary. Yeah, this is coming really quickly. Candidates are racing against the clock ahead of that August 14th primary. Today we're getting our first look at fundraising totals, the latest ones in the governor's race. And there are some surprising numbers. First, the Republicans for governor. Former Governor Tim Pawlenty dominating the race. He's raised $2.1 million. Look at that. He has a million dollars left. Endorsed candidate Jeff Johnson raised $306,000. he has got $193,000 left to spend. Here are the Democrats. Tim Waltz raising nearly $1.3 million. He's got $500,000 in the bank. Attorney General Lori Swanson, $600,000 raised. 135,000 left. And endorsed candidate Aaron Murphy raising $585,000, 234,000 left to spend. A lot of money out there. A lot of people with a lot of money, but a couple of surprises with Waltz and Tim Pawlenty. Yeah. It's still, it's a crowded field though, and all those candidates, oh, yeah. you know. What, what can we expect in the next couple of weeks? You know, I, I think we're going to expect uh, lots and lots and lots of activity to get out the vote mm -hmm. for what's going to be an unusually competitive primary in a couple of weeks here. Uh, Democrat Aaron Murphy and Governor Dayton showed up at an early education childhood center in St. Paul. Murphy promising to continue Dayton's emphasis on pre-K and all-day kindergarten. And she said she'll expand college prep programs for low-income students of color to chip away at the achievement gap. I want to make sure that Minnesotans understand that our children and their well-being is critical to me. And investing in their education and their future is our promise. It is my promise uh, to the people of Minnesota, and they are our promise when we think about our shared future. So that's Aaron Murphy today. We expect all the candidates out every day mm -hmm. for the next couple of weeks. Summer primaries are usually really slow, low turnout elections. This year, early voting is up. We've talked about that before. Yes, we have. Uh, that's suggesting a much higher than normal turnout in a couple of weeks. So, oh boy, here we go. So, always interesting. Yeah, huh. it will. So you notice there that instead of actually just keeping it specifically on the numbers, it's we're going to start the story with the fundraising numbers. Then we're going to go to our... We're going to give a nice little piece about the DFL endorsed candidate for uh, governor, and then we're going to come back to the numbers. Do you see how this is contrived to manipulate you? It is. This is all a game. Don't be a pawn in their game. Anyhow, primary is coming up in 12 days. I hope you get out and vote and uh, take the opportunity to use your uh, right to vote. We're going to end today with a parade, the Norwegian Military Tattoo 2018. Pearson producer, I'm your host Jeff Williams. You're watching North Star Oasis, reminding you there's 144 shopping days left until Christmas and approximately 94 more days until the general election. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week.